All right, so on Tuesday, uh, we had gone through the day uh, starting to create this project. And we put it into, or I put mine into a folder, and then I put that folder for you in the network folder. What we can do, you have to decide which of these you'd like to do. To continue to work on your version of the project and just keep adding to it, that's perfectly viable, or uh, to get a copy of the code, of my code, and work on that. Now, on my own flash drive, for example, I created a folder uh, two days ago uh, to be working on in, in the project. So you could continue to work with, with your folder as is like that. You have two options. One is um, if ever you don't bring your own copy of your own work, mine will be in the folder, usually. So back on the drive Z, I'm going to have a copy of, of the work there. It's going to have a folder with the date on it every time. That'll be the complete project, which will be getting bigger and bigger because as we add to it. So your options are that you could use your own work and just keep adding to it. The other option is you could use my copy of my work. And there's a third option. What you could do is also make a copy of your folder and work on the copy. So even if you don't work with my code, I recommend to make a copy of your code. For example, I'm on my flash drive here. This is my folder from Tuesday. Uh, you know, if you do right click copy, right click paste, that gives you a, a copy of that whole folder with, with a new name, which I would then rename to be today's date. The point of making a copy of the work every time is that there is then a backup copy of your work just in case as you work on your HTML and JavaScript code and all of that, and whoops, something catastrophic happened, I can't undo it anymore, well, I'm stuck with a version of my code when all those changes were made. So if you simply make a copy of your folder, uh, it could be your code, it could be my code, but if you make a copy of the, uh, of the folder, of the code, you have a backup. This one's completely messed up. OK, I'll delete it and go back to that one. Or I've got an old copy so I can see what was different and what I messed up on. So basically your options are keep working in that same folder over and over and over. I don't recommend that way because then you don't have backups. And backups are also very are always very important in case you make big mistakes. Or you could get a copy of my code, which will always be in the network folder, and then work on that. Or make a copy of your folder. Right click copy, right click paste, and work with that copy. I personally will always make a copy of my work on the, my flash drive. So I'm going to have a string of every day a new copy of the folder. And in the beginning, it doesn't matter too much because this is less than one megabyte. And yes, eventually it'll get bigger and bigger. And yes, eventually the project will be 50 megabytes. 100 megabytes, and yeah, you're going to make copies of 100 megabytes every week, let's say. You have to decide if you'd like to do that, or simply make a copy of the relevant files. Again, I can't quite tell you or teach you how to manage your own files. I will just tell you what I would recommend, because eventually you're not going to need to have copies of all of this stuff. What about if you just make a copy of the index? <coughs> Well, you need to keep track of, is it indexed from Tuesday? Is it indexed from Thursday? Is it from last week, two weeks ago? So that kind of file management, you have to kind of figure that out. But I would say, easy answer, make a copy of your folder and just put a new date on it. Uh, hard dri our flash drives nowadays are, uh, are pretty big, and we're never going to get up to use you know, a gigabyte of space. Uh, and they don't even sell flash drives of one gigabyte anymore. They come in, what, eight gigabytes usually, four gigabytes, or you know, even two gigabytes. They're, they're so cheap and plentiful nowadays that it's not a big deal, really, to make copies of your work. And if you do have a flash drive that's running out of work, or running out of space, I would recommend getting a flash drive just for this class. You know, they're very expensive. They're like $7, you know, a latte and a half. So um, anyway, I've got a copy of my work. You should have your work ready. I'm going to go back to open the index.html file in Notepad++.
So it was a whole two days ago. I just need to refresh my memory where we are at so far. So I'm going to run the code up to this point. Any browser will do. I'm just choosing Firefox because that's the first one on the list. And the keyboard shortcut you can actually do with one hand. Control Alt Shift X. You can do Chrome as well. You just have to reach over a little bit more. And I'll open up the, um, the browser and then maybe pull the browser so that it's kind of looking like a little bit tall and thin like a mobile device. Where we last left off, we had a login screen with a cool uh, email and password login, which doesn't do anything yet. And then we had a new user with an email and password confirm. If you're, if you're testing it in Chrome, you get the error when you try to join. You get the error that says, page not found. Well, that's sort of expected because we haven't fully programmed it. If you're in Firefox, it just kind of refreshes it or ignores it or something. So either way, it doesn't work yet. So we can start to actually program the functionality of getting the login system to work. So that means interactivity, and that means JavaScript. So we have enough of the project up to this point to start to work with some JavaScript to do a login logout system. So JavaScript, as we've worked with this previously, um, we've been working with embedded JavaScript in that the code is in this one file. The JavaScript code is in the uh, HTML file. And so what we're going to do is now create a brand new uh, file to focus on JavaScript only. It's often a good idea to have one file with all your HTML code, another file with all your CSS code, and another file with all your JavaScript code. It's known as separation of concerns. Really fancy way of just saying you should have the right code in the right file. And throughout this time so far, we've had the CSS and the JavaScript in the HTML and it worked. But then at a certain point, it's too unwieldy. Uh, and um, you know, doing it professionally and such, it really is that you want to have it in, in separate files. So what we're going to do here is, uh, we'll go up to the File menu, we'll go to New, File New, this is in Notepad++ of course, File New, File Save As, And in the file name, uh, we can call this my javascript.js. Save as type will be JavaScript. The name of the file doesn't matter, but the extension does, .js. And make sure it's save as type. Make sure you're, you're also saving it, that it, it sees it, and color codes it as JavaScript. In Notepad++, <clears throat> I see now a tab of the index.html file and a tab of the JavaScript file. So a lot of times we might have to have two or three files open at once so that we can edit something in one and edit something in another. And remember, you can split the view by right-clicking and selecting Move to Other View. You also have Move to Other Instance, where it'll open it in a completely different window if you want. I usually won't have it side by side like this because then my screen gets too cluttered. And to put it back, you can right click, move to other view again, and it comes back to one tab. Uh, so this JavaScript file will feature all of the CS, uh, all of the JavaScript that our, that our project will work with. And this is the one that's going to be on its own, most likely somewhere around 700 lines of code. 
the uh, HTML is about 200, and the CSS is about 100 lines of code, and the JavaScript is about 700 lines of code. So uh, the first thing I want to do here is type a quick alert here, ready to rock. If um, don't do this, but if I was going to run this, it would run in the browser and it would run this code, but not how you expect. There's Firefox running my code, and it just says the code. It didn't actually process it. This code is going to be processed uh, via the HTML file. So one thing we need to remember as we're jumping back and forth between HTML file and JavaScript file, when we run, it will run the currently active file. And we're seeing here that if I run JavaScript, it'll just say, here's your JavaScript. It won't process it. So I would have to go back to index and run the project. I ran the project, and it didn't pop up to say, ready to rock. Well, there's no connection between the two files. We have index.html, and we have JavaScript. They're not actually connected. So this is one of the things, this is one of the downsides of why we, we, why we may want to do, one of the downsides of what happens if we want to do external CSS or JavaScript. Unless the files are connected, nothing happens. Well, that's pretty easy to do. Let's go back to the index file. Let's go to the very end of the document. We've already connected to a jQuery JavaScript file. We've already connected to a jQuery mobile JavaScript file. Well, now we need to connect to the file we just created in that order. jQuery, then jQuery mobile, then our file. So new line 73. Going to create a new script tag. This will have a source somewhere. And the source is going to point to the JavaScript file you just created. If you call it anything, if you called it anything besides what I created it, what I named it, you then need to specify your your file name there. I called mine my JavaScript.js. So now if you, uh, now if you uh, save it and run it, it will, um, it might work, or it might not. Because another thing that we're dealing with is, we've got two files. My index file is saved, the disk is blue. My JS file is not saved, it's red. So I have to remember to save both files. Just like we were always saving our HTML before running the HTML, now that we're dealing with two different files, we have to make sure both files are saved. There's a handy little button right here. The multiple disk icon, save all, which also has a keyboard shortcut, uh, control, shift, s. So now we, we're going to need to remember to save all our files. We might be working with index.html my JavaScript.js, my CSS.css. So since I've saved everything, I'm going to run the HTML file. I get a pop-up ready to rock. If you didn't get that, let's pause right there, because this obviously needs to work before we go further. It did it not work for anyone? Anyone need a, need a little help there? You need to have that pop-up happen. As long as we've got this connection between our index file and our JavaScript file, we'll be able to write this 700 lines of JavaScript code here, and it will be it'll be used by the HTML, and it's used in this order. When the web browser opens the HTML file, it begins processing it or interpreting it, top to bottom gets to line 71. It takes a little detour to go to the JS file and processes all of those thousands of lines. When it's finished in jQuery.js, it comes back to the HTML. Next line, 
It goes to the jQuery file and takes a little detour there to process its thousand lines of code. When it's done in that file, it then comes back to the HTML file, goes to the next line, it goes to our file, processes one line of code, pop up, and then it comes back to the HTML and it finishes the code of HTML. So the order of things does matter. If I had my custom JavaScript code first, and I'm trying to run jQuery specific code in my in my custom JavaScript file, most likely there will be an error. If right now I try to write some jQuery code in here, well, like I said, it's going to take a detour first to process my code, tries to use jQuery, what's jQuery? Then it comes back to the HTML, then it goes to jQuery, but by that time it already tried to process code that I didn't know what it was. So the order of these things do matter. If your HTML worked, or if your JavaScript worked, we're going to um, remove that line that was just. Um, it's not for me. to raise your hand, please. <coughs>
Okay, so if we've got a JavaScript file that is connected to your HTML file, 
now we can start to write this JavaScript code that the HTML file will process. Um, everything that exists in this JavaScript file can only be JavaScript. Uh, so um, that means our JavaScript comments, we need to remember now that we've got single line, we've got multi line. So just a quick reminder right here, these are the different types of comments, line six. What we're going to do here then is now we've got that. F what I want to do first is deal with the whole sign up procedure. The app won't work at all for people until they sign up. So we, we need to set up a way to pay attention to a person filling in those fields in the sign up screen and pressing submit or go or whatever we called it. So we need to create variables, which are objects of the various things in the HTML. So first comment here, create JS variables or objects, variables of various HTML nodes or elements. We've seen that before. So VAR, we're going to create, um, Let's call this for the moment L form sign up. We've got a form called form sign up. And EL is my prefix for element. So we're going to create an element. We're going to create an object based on an element, form sign up. And this works because the JavaScript is connected to the HTML. So when the web browser starts to process the HTML, it looks at all of these tags of HTML. It gets to line, in my case, 73. And then it starts the JavaScript. And it says, OK, go find. Uh, let's go find an, uh, an element that has a certain, that certain name. Um, so we did this before when we had uh, document.getElementById. So remember, we've got form sign up in about line 30 in the HTML. We've got, an, we've got a form with an ID. So we're going to go get that element in the, in the JavaScript here. So we're going to create a JavaScript object, um, set it equal to or assign it document. Document dot get element by ID semicolon end of statement quotes so we've seen this before when we created that very simple name retrieval system thing uh, we had variables um, here's an element and inside of the uh, quotes that's the ID that is attached to the form uh, in the HTML file. Note here, uh, plain old JavaScript way to do it. So from like JavaScript 1.0, 20 years ago, this was the way to do it. Uh, you create some sort of variable object, assign it to the element with a certain ID. That's how you always did it. And it works. But part of the reason we have also jQuery is for shortcuts. And even though that's not a terrible amount of code to write, imagine doing that for the other form that we have and all of the buttons that we're going to further create. We're going to need to create over and over document.getElementById over and over and over for all of these elements that we want to interact with. Something like jQuery mobile or jQuery then lets you do shortcuts. Next line, the jQuery way to do it. var space dollar the dollar symbol l form sign up equal to, there's already one little thing different, and of course I'll explain, but let's continue, dollar sign, parentheses, semicolon. Short answer, 
that dollar symbol is equivalent to all of this. Document get element by ID. All of that that I wrote there is equivalent to a dollar symbol. So if you look at tutorials and you're kind of first learning this, and you're looking at tutorials and I'm seeing what's this dollar symbol mean? It often means that it's jQuery in action. That someone is using the jQuery library to do shortcuts. And there's no way to know that the dollar symbol is basically selecting an element, unless, of course, you read on what, on what jQuery is. So jQuery's motto is write less, do more. So knowing that with a simple dollar symbol, I can select things, I don't want to write document element by ID anymore. I don't want to misspell it again. I don't want to write that much. I don't have time. Dollar symbol works. But dollar symbol selector only works because we've got the jQuery library on line 71. If we don't have the connection to the jQuery shortcuts, then the dollar symbol way to select does not work. It'll cause errors. The jQuery way to do it, sim simply a dollar symbol in quotes. Here's another little difference. Pound form sign up. No pound sign on the plain old JavaScript way because it says get element by ID. So you don't have to put the pound sign, which pound sign means ID. Get element by ID, that's the ID. Doing it the jQuery selector way, we're selecting document get element by something, by its ID, and the name of the ID. All of this is exactly equivalent, basically, to the line right above. So that's like half of the code, half of the writing. This is equivalent to this. It's almost literally half of the code. There are differences that you're going to need to memorize, of course. But this is why kind of early on we get into jQuery early on, so that we already use the shortcuts early on. And as long as you've got jQuery running in your project, then your shortcuts are going to work. And the other way, the long way to do it, the classic way, you know, it's nice to know it, but jQuery is the way. Because we've used jQuery to select an ID, it's also common practice to put a dollar symbol in front of the variable. This would work just fine without the dollar symbol. But by putting the dollar symbol in front of variables that are created via jQuery, it also gives me at a glance little feedback, oh, I made that variable via jQuery. Because uh, elements created with plain old JavaScript cannot then be operated on with jQuery, and vice versa. If I create an element in jQuery, I then cannot use plain old JavaScript on them. It's sort of either or. That means that needs a lot of notes here. This is, of course, in the book. But um, creating a jQuery based variable, or after creating, you cannot then use plain old JavaScript commands, methods on them, and vice versa. This is again another reason why we put the dollar symbol there. Without the dollar symbol on the name of the variable, I think I made it with plain old JavaScript, or I assigned it, or I created it with plain old JavaScript, and then I try to use plain old JavaScript commands on it, and I get errors. Because it was created a certain way, so I have to manipulate it a certain way. I created this variable by using jQuery commands. It's a jQuery kind of a variable, so dollar symbol simply to delineate that. So it's good practice to add dollar in front of the variable to denote this.
we use jQuery uh, for its ubiquity. A lot of projects all over the world have jumped on the bandwagon of jQuery. Well, there's a lot of tutorials, uh, a lot of courses, uh, college courses and such. Everyone's using jQuery. There's other alternatives, of course. There's Yahoo's version of it. It's called UE. There's a bunch of other ones. So there's different shortcuts, because plain old JavaScript, I said last time, can get very wordy, very verbose. Document get element by ID. Simple dollar symbol replaces it, if you've got the jQuery library. So we use jQuery because it's so famous. A lot of people use it. A lot of organizations use it. Lots of tutorials, lots of ways to learn it. And it's compact, updated constantly, great standard. You don't have to use jQuery mobile on, on, on any JavaScript project. It'll work just fine. Um, but jQuery mobile has so many great shortcuts and features that with plain old JavaScript just take a lot more effort. A lot more typing, a lot more mistyping, and a lot more debugging. So I did the exact same command twice, line 8 and line 10. Line 8 was just for example. So comment out line 8. The plain old JavaScript way. Now we're kind of creating something redundant. It's just there for your notes. We're deactivating it by putting a comment marker on it. We only want the jQuery version. Next line, we'll say after a person submits the sign up form, perform more actions. They're going to they're going to fill in their information in the sign up screen, which is the email, password, confirm password, go. Well, after that, a bunch of stuff has to happen. Create the account, save it in internal storage. Blah blah blah. A lot of actions have to happen. A lot of commands have to happen. We need to bundle together a bunch of commands. That sounds familiar. So, what are we going to create if we want to bundle together a lot of commands? Function. A function. So we're going to say, let's create a function. Um, this is when we can decide the names of these things. We'll get very creative. We'll call this fn sign up function sign up parentheses curly braces. After a person submits a sign up form, a person perform more actions. So create a function that runs after the person. Clicks submit. No ending semicolon necessary. This is one of the debates that people get into a lot. Well, there's a semicolon at the end of every other line, and it wouldn't be a problem to actually put it there, but some browsers and some processors, they will tell you a warning, and some of it will treat it as an error, so it's just might as well not put the ending semicolon in your function definition. I'm going to break these curly braces apart into multiple lines because it's going to be several things that happen. I'm not going to write all of those several things in one line. And because as we start to write lots of lines of code here and that curly brace keeps going lower and lower, you might lose track of it. So I like to then put a little comment here and fn sign up as this function gets longer and longer and then suddenly you're scrolling from down to up and I see where what is this about again what is that end what is that ending oh I put a comment end of my sign up function okay good 
So that's optional, of course. All comments are optional, but any like little hints and stuff you give yourself are great. And this has really helped a lot of students throughout these various semesters that, what does this straight curly brace do again? Oh, it's connected back to a function I created 20 lines ago. Yes? Do you want to use an Yeah, we should have. Um, yeah, good point. OK, just one moment. I was getting too excited here, and I was already going to program the whole 500 lines. But yes, we are missing something here uh, that we did last time. Uh, let's back up and do it over here before our very first, um, right after our comment here, um, before we start to write our real code. This is what we did that other time. We did JavaScript and completely forgot it this time. Um, open and close parentheses. Open and close parentheses, semicolon. So it looks like two little eyes looking at you. And then inside of the first curly brace, uh, in front of the front of the inside of the first parentheses, function. Another open and close parentheses. So we've got these first pairs over here. Second pair. Function. Another pair. Curly braces. So it looks all like that. And all of this that we've written should have been in the curly braces. So we'll do cut and paste in a moment. But this is our iffy, our immediately invoked function expression, which I said previously, we want to do this. Short answer, we want to do this. I was going to forget about it completely, but we should put it here until, unless we, you know, it's going to forget. I was forgetting. So if he immediately invoked function expression, immediately invoked all our code should exist in the anonymous, anon, anonymous function. This is an anonymous function. It doesn't have a name. The one we were about to create a moment ago was called fn sign up. We gave it a name. This is an anonymous function. It doesn't have a name. It doesn't need a name for our purposes. But all of the code that then follows, all that we've written here that we were about to write, all of that should be between the curly braces. So the curly braces we will break apart. Uh, remind me, did, did last time we do this inside of the iffy, did we then say use strict? No. Anyone remember that? No? Okay. We'll put that there for the moment and then I'll explain it. And then all of that code after the iffy, cut it and paste it to make sure it's inside of the curly braces. You can also drag and drop notepad actually notepad plus plus actually lets you select code and simply drag the code into the right place also cut and paste don't copy and paste because obviously that leaves a copy we want all of that code that we wrote there sorry that should have been originally in the function like that and the very last line is the end of the iffy So all of that code we were about to write, instead it should have been inside of that anonymous function. So I'm going to cut it and paste it into the function. Now, uh, the tabbing and all of that, I still want it to be tabbed over. You know, um, all of these tabbed over. Don't do this yet, but all of these should be tabbed over. There is a way to tab everything at once. If you actually select everything and press tab, everything tabs over. Shift tab to untab it. So. 
before this gets too far. Uh, um, thank you for that, uh, Andrew. Thank you for that. So, um, yeah, before this gets too far, yes, I should have done this. I didn't look at my own notes close enough, sorry. But, yes, all of the code we're going to be writing should be within here. And I know it was a lot of cut and paste, so let's pause here. Is everyone here? Does everyone have their code here? It's all supposed to be in that function. Give me a sec. Yes. Can you explain why we have to use the anonymous function? Is it, I read a little bit about it. Is it because of um, privacy? Not exactly in terms of privacy, but it's about like the scope of things. When we talked about local scope, local scope and global scope, um, you know what variables are used where and such. It has to do also with if we're using different sorts of libraries, maybe we're using jQuery as well as some other library, are they going to conflict in the names of their variables and things? So it is a long answer, so maybe for the moment we'll still say just trust me on it. What's that? We'll just stick to saying JavaScript is gooder? Yes, gooder than the others. So this line here, I didn't mention what use strict was. Um, Activates strict mode of the browser. The web browser is going to process this code. Sometimes the browsers are very lenient in your code. And if your code is sort of OK, it'll say, great, your code works. Uh, it's often recommended to activate strict mode so that things that would have been OK now are wrong. Well, I want those errors to make sure my code is 100% correct, not that, they're, not that the code is sort of correct. So using strict would cause the browsers to return more errors. This, this line is wrong, this line is wrong. And we want that because we want our code to be as correct as possible. So activating strict mode of the browser then tells it, be extra harsh on us when you check our code to make sure it actually really is up to spec. So this is a fully set up project here. We have the anonymous function, the iffy. We have use strict, and then all of our other code. Technically, we've only got two lines of JavaScript so far. We've got a ton of comments, and that's fine. That's perfectly, that's OK, because we want to give ourselves notes. We've only got two lines of JavaScript, really. This little strict declaration and all of this minimal boilerplate. What we're about to do here is that uh, the idea is that a person uh, clicks Submit to create their account. It'll then process a bunch of things in here just to see that this is working so far. Uh, we'll do console.log. We clicked Sign Up. The idea is that I'm going to start to set up the process for the person to uh, put in their email, their password, uh, confirm password, and go. I would expect that clicking submit then gives us a message of we clicked sign up. Just to remind ourselves, to remind me, where is the console log output going to appear? In the browser, in the console view, F12. F12. Let's, let's go check that out. Now remember, if you run your JavaScript, you're going to get nothing. You have to remember to run your HTML file. So we switch back to the HTML, run your HTML. If I go to sign up, I click join, I click F12, oh, filling it in because we've got it required. Now this is going to be anticlimactic because even if you fill that stuff in, you click join. Um, in my case here, Firefox is giving me an error, which I'm expecting, because technically we didn't link the button of join. We didn't actually link the button join to the to the code. So in my case, it's giving me these errors, which it's fine. I expect that. 
we've written all of this code in JavaScript. Basically, pay attention. Basically saying, there's a form that exists in the HTML. And when we submit, give a message. But technically, we haven't said when the person clicks the form. So we need an event listener. We need to listen for, for the event that when the person clicks submit, do the thing, run those lines of code. So we're going to create an event listener to, to wait for that, to listen for the moment when that function is submitted. $L form sign up. Dot submit two notes here plain old JavaScript L form sign up dot add event listener quotes submit modern jQuery way. Again, it's a, almost like half of the amount of typing. The no dollar version of the variable because it was not created by a jQuery dot add event listener method. Okay, we're going to uh, listen for an event on the event that the person clicks submit. Even though the name of the button may say go or save or welcome or something, it's still ultimately input type equals submit. The input button is a submit button. The submit button is an input type. Well, the modern jQuery way is half the code. We have to have the dollar symbol because we created a reference to that form in jQuery, so dollar. And then there's a method simply called submit. So it's half the code. This is a, make sure this is all commented out, of course. We don't want two copies of the same, try, same thing trying to do the same thing. We don't want two copies of something trying to do the same thing. Inside the parentheses, function. Function uh, parentheses, parentheses pairs, and function curly brace pairs. Inside of the parentheses event, inside of the curly braces, finally, the name of the function we created to take care of the sign up process. Fn sign up event So the idea here is we've got uh, three things that we need to do. Uh, define the HTML object uh, in JavaScript, basically. Um, we have to have some sort of event listener on the event of a click, or a submit, or a right click, or a drag, or something. We then run a series of commands. Our series of commands is the function we invented here. We're making this one up. This one doesn't exist in JavaScript or jQuery. We made it up. We said, here's a brand new function, fn sign up. So when we submit, we're going to run a function. Uh, an event happened of submitting. Uh, we're going to run the function sign up. 
Uh, and then um, one more thing here, and then it'll, and then we can test it to see if it worked, because um, we needed to have this set up in order for the sign up to work. Uh, one more thing, when we back up over here, function sign up, we're defining. There's gonna there's gonna be a function that runs in, in the event of some action. The action is submit. So we can also say uh, pass in an event um, parameter. So a person clicks submit, some event happened, submit happened. Run a function. And also pay attention to what event it was. Submit. Okay, pass the event in. We just submit it. Pass it into this function so we can do more. And then the next line in the function, event.preventDefault. Prevent the default behavior. refreshing the screen. In Firefox, when we clicked Submit, it looked like the whole screen refreshed, and we went back to, to the PG, uh, PG Welcome. So the default behavior of clicking Submit, you know, for 25 years, had been you click Submit, on a website, and it takes you to another website with results. That was the default behavior. We are doing something more advanced, so the default behavior is actually a big hindrance. It's going to refresh our whole app, reload our whole app in the browser, and then even in the device. So we're trying to say, in, after the event of submitting, prevent the default behavior. Don't refresh. That's going to cause a lot of problems. Don't refresh, and then do the rest of these lines, which is, to show in your console, F12, that we clicked the button. So now let's save both files, the HTML and the JS. Run your HTML. Uh, press F12 to open the web browser right away. F12. And I'll go to sign up. Fill in whatever you want for these. It's not fully functional yet. Click Join. I get some feedback. I clicked the button. So it is a lot to set up just for a simple click. And we're going to take a break in a moment. But yes, it is a lot to set up even for a single click. And this should reinforce the scope and the complexity of software. In Firefox, something was programmed that when I click that minimize, it reacted to that, and it shrunk the window. When I click the button again of Firefox, something reacts to then pop up. There's all these events that have happened. There is sort of happening uh, event listener clicking the minimize button, and then a function runs to shrink the screen. Um, Maybe I click the, the home button here. Well, there's an event listener. On the event of clicking the home button, run a function, and the function says, take us to the home screen, which is the college. Well, I'm saying this because it, we click it, and it just does it. There's hundreds, if not thousands, of lines of code that makes those simple things happen. And I'm just showing you that for us, yes, it's, it's, this is still nothing complex, really. And I know if it's your very first time typing this, it's super amazing complex. This is not complex at all, and we're going to get much more complex. But just to see, we need to set ourselves up here. We create an object, we create an event listener, we create a function to deal with what happened. Clicking Submit. If it worked, great. If it didn't, great. Let's take a break at 7.05. We'll come back at 7.15. If you didn't get that message down there, call me over. We'll double check your code. If it did work, take a little break. We'll be there one moment.